Good afternoon and welcome to the Council of State Governments Midwestern Legislative Conference webinar series, Promoting Growth and Shared Prosperity for a Better Midwest. I'm Laura Tamaka and I'm the staff liaison for the MLC Economic Development Committee, which is co-sponsoring this webinar series. Today's event is being co-hosted by the MLC Economic or the, the MLC Midwest Canada Relations Committee. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Mitch Arvidson, who is the staff liaison for that committee, along with Eileen Grossman. We are also joined by Christina Luperini, who will help with the running of today's webinar. Before we get started, I wanted to review a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, just so you know that today's webinar is being recorded and a copy of that recording will be made available on the CSG Midwest website, um, probably by the end of the day tomorrow. So you'll be able to access that and revisit the recording. We do kindly ask that you mute your audio during the presentations just to help reduce some of that background noise that we might get. And then after each presentation, we are going to open up for some questions and comments. Um, and then at the end of all of the presentations, we're going to engage in open discussion. So throughout the webinar, please submit your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and um, our staff will call on you to speak. As I previously mentioned, this event is sponsored by the MLC Economic Development Committee and the MLC Midwest Canada Relations Committee. I would like to thank the respective officers of both committees for their leadership and guidance in planning this session. Joining us today are Illinois Senator Linda Holmes, co-chair of the MLC Economic Development Committee and Manitoba Minister Calvin Gertson, who is co-chair of the Midwest Canada Relations Committee. And they are both going to help lead us through today's event. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to Senator Linda Holmes to further introduce today's session. Senator? Thank you so much. Good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Laura. I wanna say thank you to my colleagues on the committee for hosting this event and to all of you who have joined us today. And a special thank you to our presenters for the time and effort they have put into preparing for today's session. Since October, the MLC Economic Development Committee has been hosting a six-part webinar series promoting growth and shared prosperity for a better Midwest. During each installment of the series, this committee is partnering with another of the MLC policy committees to present a virtual event on a topic of mutual interest. Our goal is to examine issues that play a role in the economic health and well-being of our region and to discuss strategies that lead to greater prosperity for our communities and citizens. To date, we've already held events on the future of the ethanol industry with the MLC Agricultural Committee, youth apprenticeship with the MLC Education Committee, education and training for prisoners and ex-offenders with the MLC Criminal Justice Committee, and addressing the childcare crisis with the MLC Health and Human Services Committee. Today, we're partnering with the MLC Midwest Canada Relations Committee, and I'd like to thank the officers and members of that committee for co-hosting this session. The relationship between the United States and Canada and the Midwest and Canada more specifically, it's a critical is at a critical juncture. In the one and a half years since the USMCA took effect several months after the COVID-19 border closures ended, and just a few months after a summer of North American leaders, we have seen how vitally important this relationship is to the Midwest's economic health. The effects of these geopolitical events have implications for the workforce and the economy, especially for employees who regularly cross between countries, for manufacturing jobs that source supplies and sell products in both countries, and for everyday Americans and Canadians who rely on agricultural products from both countries. Today, we're going to take a look at the successes and challenges of these events and forecast what they mean for the future. We have some great presenters lined up for today's discussion. And at this point, I'm going to turn things over to Manitoba Minister Kelvin Gertson, co-chair of the MLC Midwest Canada Relations Committee, who will further introduce the session. Go ahead, Minister. Thank you very much, uh, Senator Holmes, and welcome everybody virtually. Uh, it's a pleasure to connect uh, this way in the way that we can. 
Um, so to give some context, I'm here in the Manitoba legislature in downtown Winnipeg, Manitoba. It's 20 minus 23 degrees Celsius uh, outside of my window, which I think is about minus 10 degrees uh, Fahrenheit. Uh, and so even though it's cold outside of Manitoba, we find this, you know, a very warm event to be able to participate in because of the relationship that we have with our American friends. I want to also thank the MLC Economic Development Committee for inviting the MLC Midwest Canada Relations Committee to hold this joint seminar together with my co-chair, uh, Speaker Cup, who I know isn't able to join today, but we always appreciate being able to do these things together. We all are well, uh, well aware of how important the uh, strong economic relationship is between Canada and the United States, one of the strongest, if not the strongest in the world. Uh, and like all trading partners uh, in all relationships, we sometimes have disagreements, but they are overcome through our cooperation and the communication that we have in forms and through the different ways that we as legislators can get together. It was President Kennedy who famously said to the Canadian Parliament that geography made us neighbors, history made us friends, economics has made us partners, and necessity has made us allies. And I think that is as true today as when he said it in the 1960s. Canadians and Americans uh, are friends, we are family, uh, and we really miss being able to get together in the way that we have uh, for so many years, but haven't been able to in the last two years. That is true, of course, as well as legislators. We uh, look forward to being able to get together in Wichita, Kansas this July. Sorry we weren't able to gather in Detroit and then in uh, Rapid City, South Dakota last year for the conference, but we very much look forward to getting back together. So to start off today's conversation, I'm pleased to introduce David Usher, who is the Acting Consul General for the Consulate, uh, Consulate General of Canada of the, uh, to the United States in Chicago, where we met uh, last as MLC in 2019, when we were all able to get together from across the border. Mr. Usher is a career diplomat with the Government of Canada, and prior to joining the public service, he worked in the field of development in Nigeria, uh, Mulawi, Mulawi uh, Haiti, and the Philippines. In 1991, he joined the Canadian Department of External Affairs and International Trade as a trade commissioner. Since then, Mr. Usher has represented Canada in Turkey at the World Trade Organization, at the OECD in Ethiopia, and at the African Union, Argentina and Paraguay, and in various trade positions. He's well-traveled and a great expert. He began his latest assignment as Acting Consul General at the Consulate General uh, of Canada in Chicago earlier this month. And we are very grateful that he has taken his time uh, to come and share his expertise with us. So David, over to you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. And, and thank you, Minister Gertsen, for that kind introduction and, and Senator Holmes for your, your words. Um, and thanks also to my fellow panelists and to the Midwestern Legislative Conference for organizing this uh, conversation. Um, as Minister Gertsen mentioned, I've just recently arrived at the consulate in Chicago. And this is in fact my first speaking engagement in this new role. So I'm, I'm doubly honored to be joining you today. And as you probably know, the Canadian consulate in Chicago has had a decades long robust and essential relationship with the MLC, its member states and provinces, and specifically with the Midwest US Canada Relations Committee. So this is great to be able to participate in this event. Um, my remarks are meant to lay the groundwork for our discussion. So I'm gonna start with a bit of history and then move us quickly forward to the issues to discuss today. So a bit of history and some context. Uh, as Minister Gertsen alluded to, no two nations depend more on each other for their mutual prosperity and security than the United States and Canada. In fact, strong and vibrant trading networks in North America amongst the continent's indigenous peoples existed long before the arrival of the Europeans and the creation of our two countries. Ours is a partnership of neighbors forged by shared geography, common interest, people to people connections, and powerful multi-layered economic and security ties. Canada and the US defend and protect North America together. We're stewards of our shared environment together, and we stand on the world stage to respond to pressing global challenges together. 
big part of this bond, of course, is forged by our economic and trading relationship, which along with Mexico, we manage together. And for Canada and the US, trade agreements have been and remain an important part of our relationship. For example, the Canada-US Auto Pact was launched in 1965, and it led to the integration of the Canadian and US auto industries, starting us on a path towards a shared North American market. This agreement led to further strategic agreements like the 1989 Canada-US Free Trade Agreement, which was followed by the expanded NAFTA agreement between the US, Mexico, and Canada that came into effect on January 1st, 1994. And this NAFTA created the largest free trade region in the world at that time, generated economic growth, and helped to raise the standard of living for the people of our three countries. And by strengthening the rules and procedures governing trade and investment, NAFTA proved to be a solid foundation for building our mutual prosperity, and perhaps equally as important, its implementation set a valuable example of the benefits of trade liberalization for the rest of the world. The new iteration of the NAFTA, USMCA, or CUSMCA, depending on which side of the border you're on, is now the new gold standard. Going back to NAFTA, it helped grow the size of and increase the standard of living of our economies and of the middle class in all three countries. And it paved the way for unprecedented economic integration between our partners, creating a platform that allows companies in the US, Canada, and Mexico to make things together rather than simply selling to each other. And this is key because the NAFTA and subsequent agreements like the uh, USMCA have turned us from being countries and citizens who trade with each other to partners who create together. And under the NAFTA agreement, Canada and the US also developed one of the world's largest investment relationships. So now jumping forward after a bit of the history to July 1st, 2020, which is when the USMCA entered into force. So this summer, we come to the two year anniversary of the agreement. And as with any other international trade agreement, we have to work continuously to implement, adapt and apply the agreement. The July 2020 USMCA modernized key elements of NAFTA and addressed challenges of 21st century trade, promoted opportunities for the nearly half a billion people who call North America home, reduced red tape at the border and provided enhanced predictability and stability for workers and businesses across the integrated North American market. I believe this agreement has also served us very well during the ongoing COVID pandemic. And we've learned that we're all better off and more resilient when we work together. As we've seen the rapid onset of the COVID crisis, the pandemic, hit all three of our countries hard. COVID-19 put unprecedented strain on supply chains and dramatically increased demand for essential medical equipment and supplies around the world. Canada, the US and Mexico have worked together throughout the pandemic to improve coordination on our public health response and to support economic stability. COVID-19 sadly is, a, is not a good thing, but it has shown us the power and importance of efficient cross-border supply chains in a crisis. When we came to a mutual agreement to suspend non-essential border crossings, we made sure that life-saving goods like food and medical supplies could still pass freely. In fact, according to the chief economist from my department, Global Affairs Canada, Canada's trade in goods with the US recently hit a record high and it's due in part to the exports and imports of COVID-19 related pharmaceutical products. Our three countries have worked together to keep essential workers moving across the border, such as the 1,500 to 2,000 Canadian healthcare professionals that work in Detroit hospitals and care centers and our professional truck drivers who crisscross North America to help keep our shelves stocked. Now we need to go further. We need to advance this kind of coordination across sectors and policy priorities. And through USMCA mechanisms, we need to improve how we sustain our essential supply chains and facilitate the safe movement of goods, services, and people. Through partnership, our three countries can defeat COVID and speed our job and economic recovery. Our three leaders reinforced this when they met in November of last year, 
and committed to creating a trilateral supply chain coordination mechanism to define essential industries and minimize future disruptions. Unfortunately, with the arrival of the pandemic, we've seen some countries turn to protectionist measures to try to address shortages, even while others focused on keeping essential supply chains operating. Efficient and reliable supply chains have always been critically important for the delivery of goods and the continued growth of our intertwined economies. This has become even more evident during the pandemic. As supply chain disruptions continue to hamper our economies and the timely delivery of goods, the reliability of each of our supply chains and the critical role of the supply network in ensuring that commerce and deliveries are uninterrupted remains as important as ever. While we're neighbors, our supply chain relationship is not just one of geographic convenience, it's essential for the stability and security of both of our nations. And yet, politics seems to be intensifying competition, reshaping global institutions, unbalancing regional dynamics, and even altering the conduct of foreign affairs. A key question when facing these changes is the extent to which we can rely on the norms, agreements, and multilateral structures that have underpinned our dealings with one another. Our trade arrangements must be part of the toolkit that we employ to advance our collective interests in this continuing time of uncertainty. What we do as countries to address these difficulties and move forward must be done together. We must work in lockstep as we re rebuild our economies. And agreements like the USMCA do just that, create the mechanism for making trade work better so that we remain competitive together breaking down barriers that hinder trade. In fact, I would be remiss were I not to mention that this is why Canada has consistently voiced concerns with so-called Buy America policies in general, and those contained specifically in the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, as well as those in the proposed Build Back Letter Better legislation. Not only do these types of provisions run counter to what our countries have worked so hard to accomplish with the USMCA, but they will have a negative impact on US companies and associated jobs that depend on integrated supply chains to produce their finished products. At the same time, however, let me assure you that Canada shares the goal of addressing supply chain vulnerabilities and has similar concerns about the loss of manufacturing jobs due to their unfair competition from non-market players. There is more that we can do together to hold these players to account and prevent the flood of subsidized goods into North America, but applying Buy America policies to Canada is not the answer. USMCA continues to allow us to work together and to reinforce the strong economic ties that we have with one another. As we build back from the pandemic, we can look to the US-Canada-Mexico free trade zone to help. It remains the biggest economic region in the world, encompassing 22 US dollars regional market, and as I said, nearly half a billion consumers. Nearly two years ago, when the USMCA was signed, no one could have foreseen the global pandemic and the toll it would take in our economies. But when this agreement came into effect, it was already playing one of its key roles in the Canadian economy, bringing stability to what is one of the most open and intertwined export and trade relationships in the world. So for example, when the automotive sector took a massive hit from pandemic closures, it is poised to recover and benefit greatly from the agreement, providing a real life example of how the agreement is working and working well. Canadian supply firms in the North American vehicle assembly uh, system operate 270 factories in the US and Mexico. And these Canadian owned facilities stand to benefit from the increase in local content requirements for automobiles produced in those countries, which increased to 75% under the USMCA agreement, up from only 62.5% under NAFTA. I mentioned earlier how the USMCA was designed to meet the challenges of 21st century trade. With the agreement, there's great potential to expand trade in agriculture and digital services, for example. Coverage of digital services was one of the areas that was updated in the USMCA. It also contains a range of provisions to support small and medium-sized enterprises. It also has a dedicated so-called SME chapter 
to increase trade and investment opportunities for these countries, companies who play a fundamental role in all three of our economies. The SME provisions encourage members of the agreement, the three countries, to cooperate in activities that enhance their commercial opportunities for SMEs uh, owned by underrepresented groups, including women and Indigenous people, and promote their participation in international trade. It also contains updates in other key areas. So the USMCA also does rules of origin for automobile manufacturing, which I've mentioned, but also labor, intellectual property rights, and dispute settlement. And these new chapters add much needed updates to the original NAFTA agreement. The USMCA has opened up new export opportunities, acted as a stimulus to build internationally competitive businesses, and helped attract significant foreign investment in our three countries. By any measure, the North American trading bloc has been a success by serving a basis to grow both trilateral and bilateral North American relations. And this integration helps maximize our capabilities and makes our economies more innovative, more competitive, more efficient, and more productive. And this is exactly the kind of trade relationship we need to move our countries forward, especially while we still face the continuing challenges of the COVID pandemic. As we look ahead and address the much needed rebuilding that all of our countries face, we learned a few things. This recovery is going to continue to evolve. And as COVID has shown us, this is an up and down process. There's no clear finish line to the recovery process. And it's not a recovery that's going to happen easily, but perhaps most importantly, the recovery is going to happen best when we recover together. The USMCA sets the foundation to allow us to do so and to ensure continued North American competitiveness innovation and economic leadership. The agreement builds on more than 25 years of successful regional integration that helped Canada, US and Mexico compete with the world. And most importantly, the North American partnership has powered job creation. Millions of good paying jobs across our three countries depend on trade and investment with one another. That is why we must continue to work together to live up to our shared vision and our commitments and to build and sustain broad and bipartisan support for this important agreement. Canada and I look forward to working with you in this effort. Thank you very much for your time today, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Asher, and, and thank you for highlighting you know, the success that Canada and the US have had in keeping goods flowing across the border during the pandemic. I, my constituency is an hour from the Pemina, North Dakota border. And while many of my constituents express frustration that they can't drive to Grand Forks and go to Hobby Lobby like they used to, I remind them of the great success of that commercial trade that continues to happen across the border. So thank you for highlighting that. Um, Mitch, uh, Laura, did you want to manage questions that are coming in? Certainly. And thank you, Mr. Usher, for that uh, discussion. and. Thank you uh, to our uh, uh, co-chairs for hosting this and moderating this event. Our first question comes from Paul Anderson, who asks, uh, was there a change in policy beginning this past weekend regarding truck drivers attempting to cross the border? Yeah, thanks for the, the question. The short, the short answer is no. So in November of last year, um, we talked about uh, truck drivers who are crossing the Canada-US border. Uh, coming by land, and we basically said unvaccinated or partially vaccinated truckers, foreign national truck drivers coming to Canada from the US by land would be sent back to the US. So we announced that in November, and then what has happened is as of January 15th, that requirement has entered into force. And what's interesting to note is that the US, I understand, is implementing similar policies regarding uh, essential travelers and uh, and truckers as of January 22nd. So uh, the short answer is no. We announced it in November, and then as of January 15th, it entered into force. Thank you for that answer. Um, and let's see here. I'll give some people another any uh, a little bit more time to ask their questions, but I'll go ahead and answer, ask a question if that's all right. And uh, that is, revolves around the uh, trade dispute panel that recently uh, gave its first decision 
uh, on the dairy dispute revolving around the tariff rate quotas that Canada had been implementing on uh, US Canada uh, dairy trade. And I just wanted to kind of uh, pick your brain on the Canadian government's opinion of how that trade dispute panel has worked. I know a big uh, problem with the original NAFTA agreement was that there was no enforcement mechanisms and uh, trade disputes kind of just lingered on. Uh, is this new dispute panel a sign of, of a strong uh, enforcement mechanism and a, a good sign for the future of the trade agreement? Um, thanks for the question. You know, Canada has always been a supporter of um, uh, rules-based trade, and a key part of rules-based trade is dispute settlement mechanisms. So whether it's in our trade agreements with the U.S. or NAFTA, uh, USMCA, or the WTO, we were strong supporters of the dispute settlement mechanism. Um, under this one, um, uh, you know, there's no appeal process for disputes under the uh, USMCA agreement. And so within 45 days, so no later than February 3rd of this year, um, which is 45 days after the panel report came out, uh, we have to work with the US to try to find a solution to the dispute. And then, you know, uh, we'll do our best there. And if resolution can't be reached within 45 days, or if there's not an agreement to extend the ongoing discussion, the US has the ability to uh, suspend benefits under the agreement. So that's part of the rules of uh, the trade agreement. And you know, Canada and the US and Mexico uh, all support the value of rules-based trade. And so we're pleased that dispute settlement allows us to resolve issues uh, that uh, like Minister Goodson said, occasionally arise in our in our trade between our countries you know we can be we can be good friends we can still have disputes and then we work together to try to resolve them thanks absolutely well said um not seeing any other questions at this time but if any participants or attendees have questions for mr usher please continue to post those in the chat and we can address those at the end when we have a, a open question and answer session thank you very much Thank you, uh, Mitch, and, and thank you again, Mr. Uh, Usher, for answering those questions in your presentation. Uh, now I'm uh, pleased to introduce our next speaker who will give an expert's view on the supply chain and policy from the U.S. state government's perspective. Uh, Lawrence Rezatar is the Director of International Business Strategy in the Minnesota Trade Office. He joined the MTO in March of 2014 as the state's first director for foreign direct investment, and in March of 2019, added additional responsibilities for directing Minnesota's international engagement. In addition, Mr. Rezatar is responsible for managing several of Minnesota's foreign trade and investment representatives. Among his experience prior to joining the MTO, he worked in Washington, D.C., where he consulted and lobbied on international trade issues. Thank you, uh, Lawrence, for joining us and sharing your perspective uh, from the American uh, side and uh, also for bringing your expertise to this panel this afternoon. Well, thank you, Minister Gertsen. Uh, very much appreciate it um, and uh, happy to be here. It's a little jarring to see that headshot. It feels like the you know before and after and the after it just isn't all that great. Uh, but someday after COVID and being out and seeing people again, maybe I can aspire to get back to the, the look of my headshot. Um, very pleased to be here and thank you, Senator Holmes um, and your committee as well for organizing this event. It is a, a great opportunity. Um, I wanna give a bit of a disclaimer. When I'm talking about the facts and the operation of the Minnesota Trade Office, I am speaking as a trade office, but I'm also gonna give some opinion. Um, and that is not necessarily the opinion of the, the government of Minnesota, the governor of Minnesota, the commissioner. It's just some of the insights and, and kind of peeking around the corner that I think I've gleaned uh, in the close to eight years now uh, I've been in this position. And before I get into that as well, I'm going to I'm going to do three things and we can advance the slide. All right, we'll go to the next one. 
uh, where I give the perspectives and kind of the layout. Um, we're going to do three things. I'm going to give you a background on the Minnesota Trade Office, talk a little bit about the Canadian relationship, and then I'm going to get into that opinion piece on what the future could hold um, under the USMCA. Before I get to the background, I, I, I think it's important to talk about why we do what we do in the Minnesota Trade Office. Um, it really is an exercise in peacemaking. And the title of this event, Promoting Growth and Shared Prosperity, prosperity for a better Midwest really gets the heart of what peacemaking is about, right? It's creating that space and that opportunity for that shared prosperity and understanding that it shouldn't necessarily end at a border, whether it's an international border or a state border, that we're all going to do better by being in this collaborative and, and cooperative event um, and engaging with the world in this way and the challenges that we all face. And it's also about shared values, about understanding that our partners globally share values and working with those closely that share those key values on, on what we want to see reflected in our economy, in our, in our job growth, and, and just across our communities. And there's really no better example of that than the U.S.-Canadian relationship. If you could advance the slide. So to give you some background on the Minnesota Trade Office, we have three core responsibilities. We are we are responsible for assisting Minnesota's business entrepreneurs and communities with export promotion and assistance. That's kind of our blocking and tackling. Uh, if we use a football analogy, um, we know how to, how to explain to people the benefits of going abroad and how to assist them in trying to get their goods or services abroad. We want to expand foreign investment in Minnesota. Uh, when I took this job as the director of foreign uh, direct investment, I told my mom and her reaction was, that's great, honey, but it goes against everything I believe in. And I said, well, why is that? She said, well, you're trying to attract foreign businesses to set up operations in Minnesota and you're displacing American workers. I was like, no, no, this is not a, 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 an example of importing labor. What we're actually trying to do is get international businesses to come in to set up their operations to hire Minnesotans. They might send someone from the home plant to, to work through some processes and make sure that everybody's on the same page, but this is not a situation of, of transplanting workers in. Um, that assuaged some of her um, concerns and we're I, I think I, I got her back on my side eventually. And then we serve as the official protocol office for the state of Minnesota. We have 11 people here in Minnesota, and then we have these overseas contractors. Um, they are there to help us facilitate, to identify targets for foreign direct investment, and to help our companies understand the operation, the restrictions, the, the culture of the markets where they need to get their goods into. Our services involve consultations, research, assistance with domestic and foreign governments, trade shows and missions, and, and being a concierge service for foreign-owned enterprises that are working in the state. Um, within that, and I think in the context we're talking today about the USMCA and the relationship with Canada, we can only operate within the rules set at the federal level. We don't really get to make the rules. Um, so a lot of what we do is, is really trying to figure out when I talk about the assistance with domestic and foreign governments, how we can accomplish what our businesses and our clients want to accomplish within the rules as they exist. And that really was a, a big deal in, in March and April and June of, of 2020 as we were getting, the pandemic was getting up and running and everything was trying to figure out where people fit. Uh, we have a grant program that we operate for the state. We can grant up to $7,500 to small businesses in Minnesota for approved export development activities. And we help coordinate some of the various economic incentives for companies that are investing in Minnesota through our DEED programs. We are a division within the Department of Employment and Economic Development, this entity up here, um, and they operate the business finance programs, but we can help people figure out how to, to use that. Uh, next slide, please. So who are our audience? On exports, it's um, SMEs and higher education. Uh, and this is an interesting thing that I want you all to keep in mind. There are goods exports, which we all understand. It's the package that goes across the border. Some customs officer signs off on it and you know it enters the country. Then there's service exports. And those never cross a, a customs officer's desk. It could be, I'm an accountant in Minnesota and my client is in Winnipeg and I do their accounting. There's no customs officer that needs to see that when it crosses the border, but that's a service export. And an education for Minnesota is a massive export sector. Um, it's nearly half a billion dollars on an annual level that international students come into Minnesota and, 
and get their education here. And that money is considered an export service. On investment promotion, we do we work with mid-sized and large companies. We do companies that are already operating in Minnesota to help them expand or grow. Um, and then we try to identify smaller startup companies with growth potential internationally that want to scale into the United States. What we're good at is helping people figure out how to do that, how to scale, how to, how to deal with the issues if they're already operating here. We've learned we're not really good at helping people find customers. And, and if they're looking for customers, that's not something we're, we're really equipped to help at. Uh, and then we deliver the protocol advice for the governor and the legislature. In each of your states and, and provinces, you probably have something similar to what we do. Uh, they generally take three forms. It's either public, public, private, or private. Ours is public. Um, we kind of like that because it, it does give the, um, the state seal on the business card, and especially when you're dealing internationally, that state seal can mean a lot uh, when you're talking with governments and other organizations over, overseas. Uh, next slide, please. So about our Canadian relationship. Um, it is a deep and longstanding and valued relationship, um, so much so that I don't even think we necessarily think about it as Minnesotans as a relationship. It's just sort of natural. It's sort of, of what we do. Um, and these are some examples, whether it's a, a fantastic hockey coach, um, whether it's uh, International Falls or curling or entering the Northwest Angle, it is a, it's, it's always been there and it will continues to be a major sector, a major driver of our economy and our culture. Um, next slide, please. So it's this historic relationship. This is an example of the voyageurs, who were some of the first um, Europeans to enter Minnesota. Um, we, thanks to the French uh, Quebec, or French Canadian um, folks, we have a lot of French names in Minnesota. Unfortunately, we mispronounce almost all of them. Um, but we have uh, Hennepin and Duluth and Saint Cloud, which are all um, come out of <laughs> the French Canadian uh, names given to the places. We have a consulate here in Minneapolis and we have this arbitrariness of the border. If you look at the map of Minnesota, you'll see this little notch that kicks up. That's the Northwest Angle. It was a surveyor's error that put that in the United States as opposed to in Canada. So we have this arbitrary border that's a straight line and then it turns and kicks north and then follows a, a body of water. Um, but you know the issues we face across the border, whether it's the growing seasons, whether it's the quality of the water, whether it's the weather, um, is sort of arbitrary, right? And we understand that, that we need to work together on this. Canada remains our, our number one trading partner. Um, the stats for 2020, it was just over 5 billion in exports that we sent from Minnesota across the border into Canada. Now we operate a trade deficit. If you just look at the hard numbers, we operate a trade deficit, but, but that's because of the intermediate goods. So we might add some value to a good, it gets sent over into Canada, they add value to it, get sent back to us, we add more value to it, and then we send it to somebody else. But when we look at the statistics, it's going to show up as a, a trade deficit with Canada. In reality, what it's demonstrating is that we are both adding value to something, and we're both going to get the return from that as we push it out into the market. We have hundreds of locations of Canadian companies operating in Minnesota and Minnesota companies operating in Canada. It, it's really fluid. And one of the things that we see, um, and we can go to the next slide, in, in our relationship is when we're working on the export promotion and assistance with companies in Minnesota, especially small and medium-sized enterprises, we will ask them, do you export? And they'll say, no, we don't. We, we're not sophisticated enough. It's a, it's a family-owned business. We, we don't know how to do that. And we know enough to know the next question, which is, do you have customers in Canada? Oh, yeah, yeah, we've, for 50 years, we've had customers in Canada. It's, it's great. They're, you know, we go fishing with them um, every year. And it's like, okay, well, you export. Like, and I know you just don't think of that because you're thinking of the, the big challenge and the logistics challenge. But, but as soon as it's crossing that border, um, you're now exporting into Canada. So our relationship works well because we have the, the form and function of doing business is very similar. It's very easy. Um, we are also dealing with similar challenges, our workforce challenges, our, our changing industries. And I think 
when we talk about the MCA, and I'm going to get to this a little bit more later, one of the things we need to understand is it provides a platform for us to have these discussions on shared challenges that we can address and ways that, that we, can, we can get to that larger piece of prosperity for everybody in both markets. And I think that's really critical because we don't need to explain it to each other, the challenge we're facing. The shorthand is still there. The, the language barrier um, and the comprehension barrier is much lower because of the longstanding relationship we have with, with uh, Canada. And the sectors that where we see this really coming out, where it's really being important, is in the energy, in the environment, environmental technology, manufacturing, services, agricultural, digital trade, and logistics and infrastructure. Essentially, anything that we do in Minnesota um, is going to have an impact on that relationship. Um, the only thing I think that could deepen the relationship would be if we got more Tim Hortons in Canada. We had it for a while. It went away. Um, it's been a sore spot, I think, for the, the Canadian consulate here, but we'd like to like to continue to deepen that relationship, and I could we could add the, the food to a, a sector of importance. Uh, next slide, please. So this is where I get into the opinion piece and like what the future is and, and what we can do together. Um, it's, it has so fundamentally changed with the USMCA and the COVID pandemic that it is really like a, a sh, you know, the, the sands seem to be shifting very quickly. Um, we can go to the next slide. And so everything we talk about has to be informed by the pandemic response um, by the USMCA and the, it, it, it entering into force. And one of the, the areas where you saw it at the outset, and I mentioned this earlier, was in that, that March, April, May, June discussion about essential services and essential sectors. And that under the USMCA as a place that has eight border crossings with Canada, we have thousands of people that live on the border with Canada that go back and forth on a daily basis. If you're in International Falls, you know, just crossing the border to get something is just, it's normal. It's almost like, it, you know, you're crossing a border, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a river. Um, but we had to have that discussion and the, the consul mentioned it in his remarks um, with the drivers and the doctors about essential services and essential sectors and seeing together under, you know, as the MCA has entered into force, how we can work together on those essential services, those essential sectors, where they are, and, and how we continue to address the essentiality of them for the next challenge. I know, you know, in COVID, we, we've been dealing with particular ones, um, but we know there are more that are coming. And I think this gives us an ability to have those discussions in a really clear and productive way. Uh, we've got the supply chain and sourcing challenges. And I, I want to tie into this. I mean, I, we know the government of Quebec is having a seminar um, gosh, it might be next week, about um, battery manufacturing. And as we're seeing the electrification of more and more of the economy, it's an opportunity under the USMCA to really take advantage of a supply chain challenge and a policy challenge and working towards a, a combined solution that addresses the battery needs we have moving forward. And if we can find a way to do that as a kind of a, a regional engagement, um, it's going to benefit all of us. When we talk about digitalization and digital trade and cybersecurity, again, this is a this is a, a huge thing. We've seen the cybersecurity challenges um, on Colonial Pipeline, on hospitals. Whoever is committing cyber cybersecurity crimes really doesn't care if it's on the American side or the Canadian side. It's an opportunity to get some ransom, to to disrupt a system, to cause some chaos. And under USMCA, as we look at our institutions and we look at the essential services that are delivered, we, have, we, we should be looking to opportunities to coordinate and collaborate on that digital security piece because our security and our, our, the piece in which we operate is gonna be impacted and can be better served by those cross-border um, uh, engagements. And then I mentioned you know, climate solutions. Um, we have a lot of cross-border manufacturing, uh, Canadian companies that are working here manufacturing solar cells, electric vehicles. Um, 
that's exciting. And that is, those are products the world is going to want. It isn't just for here. Um, as we see electrification going broader in Europe, as we expect it to become a bigger deal in, in Asia, um, Oceania, we have an opportunity to really get ahead of the market as it's evolving and get the products out there together under the USMCA that are gonna set the standard for what the world wants and how the world uses electrified um, vehicles and alternative proteins. We know that, that food continues to be a challenge. Um, I, I've, the, the P highway, PEA highway, I guess is between here and Manitoba um, uh, where the minister is, there's a lot of pea protein that gets made out of here that can be alternative protein sources as we move forward. And that again is something the world needs. And if we, if we collaborate under the USMCA, we are gonna have that rising tide that will lift both of our boats. Uh, and then finally the workforce challenges and, and cooperation with that. We know there's work shortages. We know that there are training shortages. And I, and I really do think is if we look at this as a strategic initiative that we can accomplish under the, the trade agreement, we have the ability to come up with new solutions that are going to work for our, our employees, that are going to help close um, gaps in equity, but also answer the needs of the employers today and the needs of the employers for five years from now. So with that, um, that was all I have. Thank you very much for your time and your attention um, and happy to answer whatever questions I can. Thanks so much, uh, Lawrence, and uh, you're right. Lots of pea protein happening and processing happening here in Manitoba and along the connection. Thank you for the call out for more Tim Hortons uh, in your neck of the woods. If you can get the Vikings to win a Super Bowl, I'll work on the Tim Hortons because you got a lot of suffering Vikings fans up here in Manitoba suffering with you. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> Mitch, <laughs> yeah, Mitch and Laura, do you want to uh, handle questions or how are we doing on time? Yeah, we can uh, get to some questions, um, but as a Packers fan, I'm not sorry. I'll just say that. Um, sorry. Anyways, <laughs> I guess I have a question personally, and that, uh, as you know, Lawrence, a lot of our uh, attendees today are legislators, state legislators. So I, I don't need want you to speak for trade officers uh, or trade offices in other states, but uh, what are some ways that your office can work with legislators uh, or vice versa, where legislators work with your trade office to kind of help uh, companies, uh, industries in their, uh, in their districts get a footprint in other countries such as Canada? Ah, that's a, a great que question, Mitch. Um, you know, um, I'm guessing it's probably the same way in Manitoba and some other places um, where we just kind of put our heads down, do our work, and, and go forward, right? Um, I don't know if it's the, you know, the Scandinavian German influence or, or where it comes from, but um, there's this line I've heard, like, if you, if you talk about a success in Minnesota, then it doesn't, it, it's not real, right? Everyone should just kind of see what you do and you, you demonstrate through your words, right? Because talk is cheap. However, or you demonstrate through your actions because talk is cheap. However, it, with the legislators, I, I think there's a few things that would be helpful for working with the trade office. And this is just me speaking in my, my personal capacity. Um, one is you have a fantastic platform in dealing with small businesses and medium-sized businesses in their communities. And we know that companies that export, that work with foreign clients are more resilient to downturns. They get more and in, in more interesting technology um, and they grow. So as you're talking with your constituents about, you know, what's going on in their community, keep in mind that you've got something like this in your in your state or your province, and they're and they're happy to help. I think on a on a policy level, you know, where we're at our best is when we are when we are taking on not just the the blocking and tackling, but the the sectors that are emerging and, and how we can really lean into those and create those collaborations and. Um, we've done certain things like we've done virtual tech pitches to, to get companies that are in key sectors from Minnesota um, in front of amazing judges and panels in Minnesota so they can get feedback on whether technology even work. Like, how does this, how does this happen? And, and providing support and kind of thinking about, all right, where do we want 
the state to be in, you know, in five and 10 years and how do we want to expand these global markets is really important. And then finally, you know, the funding mechanism we have for our legislature is a tremendous, tremendous tool for small businesses because it mitigates the risk of them going abroad. And, you know, if, if it's a $7,500 grant um, in the grand scheme of things, you know, that $7,500 to a lot of you know, mid-sized and large companies is, is nothing. But for a small company, I mean, taking on $7,500 of risk for the purpose of trying to create an international market is really scary or taking on $15,000. But the fact that we can absorb half of that risk really shows that we're putting our, our money where our mouth is and that we think this is better for them in the long run. It's more sustainable and it's going to help them grow their their base here as well as open up maybe new markets for older technology where the market here has moved past it absolutely well thank you for that answer and a lot to chew on for a relationship between legislators and and trade offices in their individual states thank you lawrence and uh, i'll kick it back to minister gertson thanks mitch thanks again uh lauren so our final presenter and perspective uh, for this uh, video conference will be from the private sector. And so we're gonna look to the world's largest food processing and commodities trading companies, which handles cross-border supply chain logistics. Chris Berm uh, is president of transportation of Archer uh, Archer Daniels Midlands Company. And we're very grateful uh, for you uh, for your company, for everybody in the private sector who has helped us over the last two years ensure that the, because um, there was a lot of fear back in March of 2020 that the goods that people need uh, still got to them, particularly when we're talking about food production. Mr. Berm joined ADM in 1991 and has served in a variety of merchandising and management positions since that time. He most recently served as the president of Grain and before that as advisor to the office of the chairman, Mr. Berm sits on the board uh, for ADM Crop Risk Services and Benson Quinn Commodities. So thank you very much, uh, Chris, for joining us here today for all that you do and for what you're gonna share with us this afternoon. Uh, thank you, Minister Gers Gertson for that introduction. And, uh, you know, I'd like to say, and thank you for the comments on, uh, uh, you know, keeping trade flows going during the pandemic. and. Earlier, you were talking about, uh, uh, in, at the open of this, you, you were talking about kind of the, the policies and the decisions were made. And I, I think that, you know, as, as human beings, as societies, uh, all things going on, there's been a lot of Monday morning quarterbacking that's transpired over the last two years on, on, and on all the decisions that should have been made differently. But I think one and maybe the most important one that was made was, you know, the ag exemption and the and the focus on on keeping uh, goods flowing to keep the the the, the short the store shelves, you know, supplied and in the food supply and and so I appreciate that and and so I, I think I'm trying to say is that that there alone was kind of what we're talking about here. That was a public private partnership on how those decisions were made. And I, and I think there's too much of talking about what we did wrong. And I think we certainly should celebrate that one that we did right, um, you know, as, as individual, as private companies and public, both uh, in partnership together. And I think something that we can build on and learn from, from the future. So, so thank you. And, and thanks for letting me, you know, speak today uh, in front of this conference and uh, this webinar. And I think that it's, um, you gave a little bit about ADM's uh, background that we are the largest bulk commodities processor, feed grains, oil seeds, and animal feed and nutrition that, that goes uh, you know, directly into the food supply on the store shelves and, uh, and a lot indirectly. And it's, it's, I think it's just the, the timing is, is so ironic that really what a, what a perfect time this is to talk about uh, with what's going on. Um, because what I'm going to talk to you about today is kind of a uh, a challenge that we're playing out in real time uh, going on right now in the egg, egg supply. And, you know, and, and for us, um, I had uh, um, back at the, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, we had a person new that was in our supply chain that, that came from a different industry in our organization. And, and she made the comment to me, it's like, you know, Chris, you, you seem to be really calm during all these, these activities or this, these challenges and these disruptions we'll have. But, you know, and I, I told her, I said, well, 
for us in the in the ag commodity kind of trade world that, that we live in, the pandemic is just another one of those things, right? We just came off the Chinese trade relations or you know the the trade war with the U.S. and in, in, in China. There's always a problem. There's a crop disaster somewhere. There's a problem somewhere around the world, and and there's always challenges that we're fighting. Now this obviously was a, a major one, but it it was we were kind of almost in tune, this is what we do. We have to at attack these challenges. And so I think the background that we had from all these other challenges was kind of like practice. It kind of prepared us for the for the big stage, which COVID presented two years ago and continues to present as we go forward. And so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna kind of talk about a, a real situation that's kind of more of that conventional type issue that we have in the ag commodity ag production world that, that's really kind of playing out in real time right now for Canada. And so if we could go on to the next slide, I, I'd like to share that with you. So um, I'm showing you a lot of numbers here and, and what's important is not to look at the specific numbers, but there's a couple of things you just wanna look at the trends. And what I'm showing here are corn and wheat, which are the primary feed grains uh, that we think about and canola and soy, soybeans being the primary oil seeds, oil seed producer or commodities. And if you look at, at the top line in each category, the area harvested, you can really see for the last five years, the, uh, the, the number of acres planted, um, you know, collectively has been flat to slightly reduced in the total number of acres planted. And you may ask, well, where is a lot of that going? Well, it was mentioned earlier, uh, you know, Lawrence talked about it uh, and previously just here about the, the growth in, in pea production, for example, in, in chickpeas and those sort of things. So there's been sort of a transition from more of the bulk commodity feed grains and oil seeds more into uh, you know specialized proteins to feed the the growing demand uh, for for the world for a you know a, a vegetable protein type diet. But also I'd like you to look at you know probably in, in the world that I live in the in the world of commodity trading, uh, you know things that really kind of drive the the dynamic business can be as you look at the bottom right corner uh, of, of the numbers there in each of the spreadsheets of the of the matrices. And it's the, the the carry out ending stocks and basically uh, you know the crop years run uh, September one to August thirty one and uh, and so it's it's portraying uh, what the the ending commodity of, of that bulk commodity will be in Canada uh, you know in, in in metric tons and as you can see uh, corn is you know about twenty five percent less than it was five years ago and 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 uh, you know is down from the last couple of years. Uh, the ending stocks in wheat are are down considerably, but you know, look at canola. Very concerning on the on the carryout number canola, of of the with the with the situation there and and a and a challenge that presents for the crush industry, the canola crush industry in Canada. Then also on soybeans, and the soybean number is has, has come down quite a bit. And and you know, and the first question is that you know you look at that the yields. There's been a sharp decline in the yields this this current growth year, growing year, and it's it's really caused by the, the drought that has happened in Canada. So in the backdrop of, of, of all the things that are going on in the world, we've had a probably one of the worst droughts. I don't need to tell the, the Canadians here about this on the phone with, with or on the, on the video with how, how devastating that has been, but it really, really um, hurt the, uh, the uh, you know, the production. And I'm sorry, uh, there was a question there about what crush means. Crush is when you take a raw commodity, an oil seed like a soybean, a soybean or a canola, and you run it through a factory called a crush plant, and it turns that canola into basically into, into two major products, uh, a canola meal, which can be fed to swine, poultry, uh, dairy, you know, to, to animals, and then canola oil, which is the, which is the oil then that can be further refined to be made into the, into the oil that can be used to cook at home, or it can be used in the production of biodiesel. Um, you know, now we're talking about the, the renewable green diesel, which canola doesn't have a pathway for that yet, but uh, uh, there, there's a lot of, you know, there's huge expansion expected in Canada for that uh, as, a, as is expected to be accepted at some point. And then the same for soybeans. Um, you take the soybean, you crush it, and you can turn it into soybean meal, which is fed to poultry and, and animals and livestock. And then the oil, which is can be used for same thing, um, you know, food products for, for food cooking or also uh, you know, industrial use or into the into the use of biodiesel. So, so sorry about uh, passing that on. And so, as we look at this with this severe drought, this has caused a a a severe um, shortage 
of, of, the, of the base crops in, in Canada. And so if we could roll on to the next slide, um, please. This just shows another five-year clip where the, where the, the gray line shows uh, each of those crops that, that Canada imports, you know, typically annually. And the red line being the ending stocks, which we just showed uh, that bottom right, uh, you know, the, the ending carryout number of the raw base commodity. And you can see that uh, uh, corn imports are gonna have to go way up in, in, in this, and like I said, in that 21-22, that's really talking about from September 1st of 2021 through August 31st of 2022. Um, you know, wheat, same with wheat, but, but look at the canola, right? I mean, uh, essentially canola, there's been virtually, none of that has ever been, in, you know, virtually zero gets imported into canola. Can, Canada has historically been a huge next net exporter of canola. That's beyond their, their, their pretty high demand for, for crushing it uh, locally themselves. And then the, the same can be said for soybeans. And so, as you can see, we're laying out the backdrop here that, that and I think earlier, uh, uh, David made the comment about uh, the dollars that, 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 that projected for 2022 in terms of, of, of imports uh, into Canada. And, you know, and, and what I'm gonna show you here is that there's gonna be a huge appetite to, to import uh, uh, US crops out of the Midwest into, into Canada. So the next slide, please. And so this shows here, the stack bar chart show different commodities, uh, you know, which are canola, corn, flax seed, sorghum, soybean, sunflower seed, and wheat. Um, and, uh, and then we show the basic, the, uh, you know, Pembina, North Dakota, the different points, border crossings in the United States to go into Canada. As, it, as you can see, for the last uh, three years, um, or if you look at 2017 through 2020, and, and mind you, these these, this data doesn't show up by crop year. This is actually by calendar year. So you can see in calendar year 2017, 2018, 2019, and 2020, somewhere between about 1.4 and, and 3 million metric tons of those commodities were shipped from the US into Canada. Well, as you can see in year to date 2021, because this is two months in arrears. So uh, this, is, this does not have uh, November and December uh, in those numbers yet. But we had already just in, a, in, in two months, three months had shipped 3 million metric tons into Canada uh, already. And, and so basically the, the previous four years imports have been already met in, in essentially less than the first, in the first quarter of this crop year. And, and the final 2022 uh, forecast there is showing what could be is, is was what some people believe could be the number uh, that the demand amount could be as much as almost you know 6.75, 6.73 million metric tons. There's a of, of products and, and with the demand could be as much as 6 million metric tons of corn of that alone. That could be the demand. The problem is uh, that the challenge is, and this is the challenge we're trying to live out in real time is, is execution. And, and, and when we talk about this, so, um, there's been a lot of talk, you know, the first question is, be, well, what does it take to, to allow something like this to even happen? And, and I think the first thing that, that in the, in this thing is in place, and, and it's one of the topics here today, it's, it's the USMCA, is the first thing you have to have is you have to have a, a general base policy that would allow something like this to happen, where, where essentially overnight in a year, you're going to have to maybe double the amount of uh, product that is needed and it's needed. I mean, we're talking about feeding animals and, and uh, keeping facilities running it. It's, it's an, it's an important, very important uh, service that must be filled. And yesterday I was talking to a, a colleague of mine who 30 years ago actually ran a crush plant in Windsor, Canada, just across the border. And I was kind of talking to him about what it was like, you know, previous to 1994, when, when NAFTA was passed, and, he, and I think he referred to it as like free trade zones back then, and it was very, very challenging. And he talked about, he goes, man, I wish I could do that job again uh, in today's world with, with, the, uh, with what the USMCA has done. So, you know, in the USMCA policy uh, for agriculture, agricultural products has, has been a boon. And, and I think we, it was mentioned earlier, it's about one of those, you want these things where, where both sides can win. And I think clearly uh, what's happened with agricultural trade 
And if you look at the proliferation of, of, of crushing plants for this stuff on both sides of the border, whether it's in North Dakota or in, you know, in the Southern Prairie provinces, in the Southern and the Prairie provinces, it's, it's been very, very large. And so I think that's, that's been very conducive. And so the base policy is in place, you know, to, to achieve uh, this type of, this type of number, but, but, um, you know, and, and I'm going to stick with the, with the football analogies that are, that are, that are going forward here that, that have been used previously kind of to describe what's going on here. I, I think that, that you, you talk about it in a football, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about the Packers, I guess, because uh, as uh, we, we know we have one Packers fan on here and they're playing this weekend is that, uh, um, and maybe we'll use the opposite, we'll use the 49ers that are coming in. You want to come in with the game plan. What is the game plan? You know, every coaching staff, every team, every organization thinks they have the perfect game plan. And so essentially, I'm comparing that to the, the USMCA. We've got the perfect backdrop. We've got the perfect game plan in place. Now, but, we'll, but, but one thing we do know is that the perfect game plan does not always equal perfect execution on the field. And, and quite frankly, um, that's that's the things that we're trying to work out now in this situation that, that, that I'm describing, you know, just like in the football field, what can be some of those things that come up that, that don't make it well, it could be the weather, the, the weather turns out not to be what was anticipated if there could be an injury, we could have an unforeseen injury. Uh, previous to that game right before it in practice or maybe in the game, or there could be something that, that you know challenges there could be the officiating may not go as we think it should and so those are things that we have to adjust to on the fly to try and make that perfect game plan move, play into real time and into execution on the field. You know, and so, so what are some of those challenges that we're dealing with now? And, you know, the earlier question uh, came up about the, uh, you know, the vaccination, uh, you know, situation going on that, that Canada has put in place and, and now the U.S. is going to as well, is I don't need to tell anybody on this call is that, you know, truck drivers, finding the truck drivers are, are, are impossible right now. And, you know, I've been in this business for almost 31 years. And I would say for really the first 25 years of my career, truck drivers were, were in ample supply. It was like, well, if we'll just, there, there'll always be a truck driver to, to do this. And for several years, um, we've seen these trends to where we were going to be short truck drivers, um, you know, over time. And and I have another colleague that works with me that kind of changed jobs and going from a rail role into a truck role. And, and, but we were always in the same meetings over those years. He's like, Chris, I never took serious what you were talking about this challenge with truck drivers, but now I've changed jobs. It's like, this is a real problem. And, and yeah, it is a real problem. And, and I think, so for many years, we've kind of, we've kind of taken it for granted that there will always be a truck driver there to do this. And so, you know, and we as an organization, we have, you know, trucks that cross the border every day on both sides, based in Canada and some based in the United States that go either way. And so it's going to create more challenges. It's going to create more cost. And, and so I think that sometimes we need to think about is, you know, there's the base policy, you know, but the devil, the devil is always in the details or it's always in those plays that happen on the field or those real in time changes that we need to adjust to and make. And, and, and those are the things that are going on. And, and, uh, you know, I read this morning, I think that, uh, you know, about somewhere between 50 and 60% of, of US truck drivers are vaccinated, which, you know, I work for a large corporation and, and uh, you know, the lowest percentage of the vaccinees that we have kind of as groups are, and it's not just truck drivers, it's barge, it's kind of people in the marine industry, it's truck drivers, and it's people that work in our rail business. Those tend to be our, our lower, lowest level of vaccinated on a percentage basis. And so, so really what it's doing, is that now we're, we're really reduced at, at a time when, when, when everything, when everybody can go anywhere, we're short truck drivers. Now we're really condensing the pool in terms of where truck drivers can go. This is really one of the challenges that we're going to have, you know, facing is, is I think this could be, this, this challenge is going to be tougher now going forward than it has been the previous two years. And, and it's something that it's going to, it's going to drive up cost. It's going to create uh, slowdowns and, and, uh, you know, and, and companies, I'm sure, are, are looking at their workforce because what's, what's different today than maybe was different 5, 10, 15, 20 years ago described earlier is that sometimes before truckers or trucking companies didn't have another choice is like, well, we, we need to haul, we need to haul, we need to do that business. Well, now, uh, every day we have truckers that are dropping loads on us because they can go find something better to do today. And so if you put another constraint on that, 
that is a challenge that we're going to continue to 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 deal with. And um, you know, another challenge that you know this isn't just about truck drivers. What I'm showing here on this screen, and 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 one thing we'll talk about is that the market probably believes that it's probably only possible to maybe ship about four million metric tons of that three to four million metric tons of the corn, estimated six million, and all the others, because there's a lot of other physical constraints um, besides just trucking, because a rail is a big portion of this. And, you know, we've had, uh, uh, you know, serious challenges with, with railroads. Um, you know, they put in some different uh, uh, operations over the last five years that, 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 that haven't been, you know, there, there are some good to them and there are some challenging things that required to them. But one of the things that's done it, it really kind of reduced the number of resources in their organization. When I say resources, I mean both people and I mean, you know, engines and cars and that sort of thing. And, and, and in, in the railroad's defense, they had some hard decisions to make back during COVID. You know, you think back to, you know, it was talked about the automotive earlier that, you know, one of the, I remember one of the railroad folks telling, North U.S. railroads telling me uh, that, you know, this was the first time in, uh, since World War II that, uh, you know, there were, we went a month without producing a single car in the United States. And so you think about that kind of shock that they had to go through and they had to make these, some of these hard decisions on labor. And so, you know, they laid people off, they furloughed people, they, they reduced their operations. Well, then it was kind of a guessing game to how to bring people back to work. And, you know, me from the, from my, from the seat that I sit, I'd been telling them for a long time, you need to bring people back. Cause number one, I kept telling them as, as it was, as a uh, minister Gertzen said at the beginning, the ag commodities kept flowing and, uh, and kept telling me, you know, just because, you know, maybe car automotive slowed down or maybe oil slowed down, we're not. So you, we got to keep moving our stuff. And what happens is they probably peeled back too many resources. And, and I also think that they made a little miscalculation. And I, I don't think that's anything new. They didn't, they, they tell you this themselves. They had a much harder time, which they're still struggling with getting people coming back to work. And so we've had a, a strain on the U.S. rail system. And, you know, then you think about, you know, you, you think about that that same crew and engine that can that can pull a grain train can also pull a, a double stack out of LA Long Beach going going to Chicago to bring a whatever you know container of the Christmas gifts or whatever whatever those things we're talking about and so they're going the, the, those same rail cars are moving on the same track and those same engines can pull the, the same thing and so so there's there's a very much a competition for for those resources and so because of that. Um, rail service is really challenged. And so um, that, that along, um, and railroads were already struggling with these things. And, and then you throw in, in this, this drought situation that, that we have going on in Canada. And so there's all of a sudden there's something new. There's this new trade lane that, as I can show in this screen, has been used in the past, but we want to double, maybe more than double just overnight that route. Uh, the market's really not prepared for that, have enough crews and people. Well, then you throw in, uh, you know, 10 days ago, they had the, the Arctic blast and this, I think got way colder and it slowed things down. And there's just, there's just so many things. So there's that weather event, which actually can, can affect a football game can also really affects what we're trying to do here. And, and so I'm telling you all these things, you know, when I look at the, uh, uh, at the topic I'm supposed to talk about is that, you know, how do we, how do we deal with these challenges? It's easy to sit there and talk about them. You know, what is it that we can do about them? And, and I, and I think I, I see a similarity here um, in terms of really how we how we organize ourselves as a, as a private company and how we face talking to the railroads, for example, and really how do we address situations like this? And, you know, this is kind of a phrase that I use. And I don't, it's a phrase that I use that I don't know if it really uh, um, is company wide, but we really kind of what I'd call a, a stratified approach to how we, how we approach these issues. And what I mean by that is that we really have, have you know, we, we talk about, I think sometimes it's big companies as whether we're public or whether we're private or whether we're in the public, when I say, or, or you know, governmental companies, we, we talk about all these processes and sometimes we become, we can become hamstrung by our own processes. And so we need to be careful of that. But, but the one thing that we have to do in the stratified approach, what we try and do is we try and have, it comes back to relationships with people, is having relationships at every level. And so that may be on the ground in Windsor, Canada, or in Detroit with our, with our local 
group there. They're working with the local, um, you know, border people, trade compliance people there. We, all, we as a company, we kind of operate our really our trade and compliance. We have a centralized center of excellence, which is one group here in the North American corporate headquarters in Decatur, Illinois, that really handles it for the whole company to deal with, with, the, with the mega issues, the rules and, and those sort of things. And so we, we have a relationship at the local level with the people where things happen, because sometimes things can be resolved. There just may be a, you know, a, a simple issue with the, with, with the paperwork or something like that, that can be handled locally. Well, then there's maybe more of a, you know, a, a bigger picture, picture issue that, that can be addressed at, at, at the next level. And it may be with the trade office. It may be, um, you know, through our trade compliance group working with people. And then we also have to have a, a relationship with our government, government affairs folks that, that may be, uh, you know, working with our folks in, 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 at any level of government. It could be state government. It could be in Washington, D.C., or it could be in Ottawa, where we where we're, where we're working at those levels. And that really, that same approach is the, really the way we handle our logistical problems. We have a local, you know, it may be, like I said, on the ground, it could be in, in Enderland, North Dakota. There's a local relationship between our plant in Enderland and the local Canadian Pacific folks. Then we also have a, a relationship at our mid-level manager level, the, the folks that are running our, running our cars and doing our scheduling. But then there's also a relationship at my level at, at the senior levels at those railroads, we've got bigger picture issues that we need to address. And so to me, that's how it is. It, 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 it's, and it's, there really isn't any set policy that there is no playbook. This is what we do. And, and I think that, and I mentioned earlier is that sometimes we, we hamstring, our, hamstring ourselves with these, with these policies, but what we have to do is that we have to have these personal relationships because just as we've seen, and we've said at the beginning, I, I know David said this at the beginning that, man, we've really become, well, we, we've become really good at, uh, at presenting on Zoom now after two years. And, and so we have to take these learnings and because everything is evolving and things are changing. And, and, uh, and so I, I think that you have to have that ability to, to jump outside the processes and to, to keep things going. Because if we don't, the system's just gonna, it's just gonna shut down. And, and that's what we can't afford to do. And uh, that's really all I have prepared. And I'm welcome to take any questions if anybody has any questions. Thanks so much, uh, Chris, for that and for reminding us that it's not just the pandemic that you and others deal with. Um, shortage of truck drivers, you mentioned the drought that's very significant on the prairies here in Canada is a, is a really, really good reminder um, that uh, this isn't the first challenge that you've, you've dealt with. And so we appreciate the the ingenuity of the private sector and keeping things moving uh, because our constituents do appreciate it. Mitch, do you want to, uh, to handle the question side of things? Sure, uh, I can go ahead and do that. And uh, I think this first question is uh, more so for Chris. And uh, that is, maybe it might be too early to kind of tell uh, since the USMCA only came uh, into enforcement on July 1, 2020. We've also been dealing with the pandemic during that time. Uh, but just from a logistics standpoint, from a supply chain standpoint, and from a private sector standpoint, what are the major differences that you've seen between the USMCA and how you had to deal with NAFTA in the past? You know, I don't know if there's a, you know, a lot of, a lot of changes yet, and in, in the, in the, in the, there are, you know, probably the nuances with, with COVID, but I, I think that the biggest change we're going to see that maybe, maybe we're seeing, but we just can't realize because of the pandemic, it's just, the ease, the ease of doing things. And, and like I said, I, um, you know, I, I mentioned a colleague that worked 30 years ago and just talked about how, how difficult it was and how much better NAFT is. I think we'll see some of that even as we move into this next level. It's just the ease of doing business. And, and I really think that it's going to be very important. And why do we say that? As I talked about is that as there's this change for this demand for renewable green diesel, you know, there is in, in, in Canada alone, they're, they're talking about a between a, a 30 and a 40 percent increase in the in the canola oil production increase, and so there's going to be a lot more cross border activity, and that, that's going to be there's that oil is going to need to go somewhere, or you know Canadian um, canola oil once canola gets a pathway into the renewable green diesel, so there's going to be probably qu quite a pathway of trade between California and Canada, for example. There's a there's a big one today, but that could even double just based on on. Canada, California's demand for renewable green diesel. Absolutely, thank you for that answer. 
Uh, I have a question that is probably best aimed for David. Um, one of the uh, kind of big geopolitical events that we uh, kind of advertised uh, ahead of this meeting was the uh, North American Leader Summit that happened uh, last year with uh, uh, President Biden and Prime Minister Trudeau and, and President Lopez Obrador. Uh, so we kind of have all seen what's going on at the national federal level as far as direct consultation and relations uh, between our two countries. What, is, what are some ways that maybe state legislators and members of legislative assemblies in the provinces, how can they uh, kind of strengthen the relationship, not only trade relationship, but uh, diplomatic relationships uh, between our two countries? Well, I mean, I think, I think your organization, Mitch, is, is a great model, you know, because, you know, Minister Gertzen is a co-chair of a key working group. You know, the ability to, to meet, even virtually, even if we can't meet face-to-face -face during COVID, the ability for, for legislators and, and policy assistants to meet, to talk informally, to understand each other's concerns is, is what we will all benefit from. You know, that's why for me, you know, a presentation like the one Chris gave today is great because it's telling us about the reality uh, of the business community, which is what we as government officials need to understand. So the, the USMCA is good because it creates lots of platforms for discussion. But I know that as legislators, there's lots of other mechanisms that exist. Yours is a great example, but there's others you know, there's, there's friendship associations between different states, between the two countries, and they're all good because um, uh, talking and understanding each other's position is key to finding solutions that work for both parties. Absolutely, and uh, that makes a lot of sense. And I hope people will continue to uh, tune into these meetings as well as our annual MLC events and, and continue the uh, partnership between Canada and the US. Um, uh, we don't have any further questions at this time, so I'm going to kick it over to uh, Senator Holmes for, for some final wrap up. Thank you so much, Mitch. Um, I do before I before I wrap it up, I do just want to say a couple of words to to Chris there as that had better not be some sort of self fulfilling prophecy that Aaron Rodgers will be injured when it comes to the game Saturday for the Packers. I just want to point that out. Other than that, I want to give a big thank you to Minister Gertzen for your help in leading today's event and to our colleagues on the MLC Midwest Canada Relations Committee for co-hosting this event. A special thanks to all of our presenters for the time and the effort they put into offering some great information to us. And thank you to all of the participants for taking time out of your busy days to join us. On behalf of the Economic Development Committee, we hope that you will join us for our final session in this series. That's going to take place on Friday, February 11th. And that webinar will be co-hosted by the MLC Fiscal Affairs Committee and focus on how states are using federal COVID relief funds. You'll receive an email notification when registration is open. And we hope you'll join us in February for this virtual event. Laura, if you'd like to close us out, and this has been an absolutely wonderful session. Thank you. Thank you. Um, on behalf of my colleagues here at the CSG Midwest office, I want to thank Senator Holmes and Minister Gertzen for leading this session. And then also thank you to our presenters, um, David, Lawrence, and Chris, um, for your great information and knowledge and sharing that with everybody this afternoon. Um, I just want to reiterate again, February 11th will be the final um, session of this series. So we hope to see you on that. You will be receiving information about that. The recording of this webinar will be on the CSG Midwest website, but you also receive an email from me with the link to that. And please feel free to share that with your colleagues. And with that, we're gonna close it out. Um, thanks for joining us. Um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon and your week and hope to see you soon.